So I'm Minna Proctor. I'm, um, I'm the editor of the Literary Review. I'm also, I also translate from Italian and have been reviewed, both kindly and cruelly. Um, and I also write reviews and frequently review books in translation, kindly and cruelly. Um, so I'm actually wearing five different devil's advocate hats as well as moderating this panel. Um, the Literary Review is a literary quarterly. We publish a lot of works in translation. We've been running since 1957 out of Fairleigh Dickinson University in Madison, New Jersey. Um, and our panelists today are Michelle Johnson. She's man managing editor of World Literature and Translation. World Literature Today. World Literature Today. But I, li I like the new title because we, we, we feature a lot of books in translation, so that could be our subtitle. I had to, it's a good one. I, you just, just so everybody's prepared, I had to, um, I had to present an, uh, the Translator Award at the Penn Awards a couple of years ago. They called on me to just present and read the names of all of the translators, and I don't know what they were thinking because I'm, I have all sorts of verbal quirks and in, in particular kind of syllabic dyslexia. And so when they presented me with all of these really exciting names that I had, just like 20 names that I just had to go through and every syllable was up for grabs. It was <laughs> chaos. I'm taking yours back to our next editorial meeting. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really a good title. <laughs> Katrine Jensen, mm -hmm. who is the editor of the Asymptote blog mm -hmm. and a translator from Danish. She's got a book of poems coming out next year, which will be reviewed kindly, yes. kindly. and cruelly. In, in rural literature and translation. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and Mark, uh, just do your name for me so I don't have to. Athetakis. Athetakis. Mark Athetakis, who is a book reviewer. He's here as our kind of like I just write a lot of book reviews, and often they're books in translation. But you don't come from a translation background. I do not. Much to my parents' disappointment, I never picked up Greek, um, and I don't do any translation. I don't have, have written anything that's been in translation. So, so he's a, an official interloper right. in the Alta community, and so that's interesting. It's always nice to have somebody who doesn't see the world the way we do talking to us about how we see the world. Um, so this subject, I've got to go over to my brandy sifter of iced tea. So this topic is a perennial. We, we, we have done this panel several times at Alta. It comes up a lot. And, um, and there are a couple of topics that we like to touch on for people who've never been to this panel or, or earlier iterations of this panel. But one of the things I did want to say before we started with questions about um, how do reviewers get chosen for books in translation? How do book editors pick books they want to review? Who has the right to review a book in translation? What if you don't speak any languages? Who are you to know, et cetera? Um, I did want to say that we have this panel every year. We talk about this material a lot, the subject matter. Um, six months shy of 20 years ago, I was a, the, um, the official um, office person for the Penn Translation Committee. I forget what my title was. I was like the coordinator <laughs> in the Penn offices for the Translation Committee. And so 20 years ago, what the Penn Translation Committee did was we had a watchdog campaign where every time a review appeared in a publication, usually a major publication, and the publication neglected to put the translator's name in the top matter, the headline, you know, it just said the name of the rose by Umberto Eco. See, I'm going back in time. I'm, it's the reference is the, the name of the rose by Umberto Eco, and it magically appeared in English. And then there would be a long review, and it might talk about the language, and there was no mention of the translator at all. Twenty years ago at Penn, what we were we were so focused and dogged about, we would then write a very formal and aggressive letter to the New York Times book review and say, you must mention the translator's name. And it was, it was the substance of our work. And to a large extent, um, I think those efforts were successful. They went on for a while, and I think Margaret might correct me, but I think, I think most of the major publications now list the translator's name. Am I 
Am I saying a um, malarkey? For the most part, like the New York Times does it. Let's just say letters are still being written. Letters are still <laughs> being written. But it is, it is significant. It's, this was my full-time job back at Penn 20 years ago. That's all I did was write letters to people about the translator's name. So now it's not necessarily a full-time job. We've come a long way about that. Efforts went then to talking about mentioning that the book was in translation and reviews. And so what we, what's happened over the last few, over the last you know, 15 years is that we've come as a group of translators to to wondering how we feel about being noted in a side mention, the book was aptly translated by Minna Proctor in the course of a 700 word review, a 2000 word review, ably translated by, smooth prose by, dreadful, <laughs> clunky, hard stuff by, but just like a little line there and then the rest of the review has nothing else. So it's almost like a nod to the translation. And I think the consensus among most translators is, is that necessarily better than being ignored? It's yeah. terrible to be ignored. It's kind of not satisfactory to be just nodded to, but it's better than being ignored. So the conversation, I think, has become more nuanced. Now what we're talking about is whether we're being ignored, whether the, um, and whether we're being, or whether we're being discussed adequately um, and then I think one of the things that it's now time to talk about uh, again, and it, none of these discussions are new, but one of the things that are worth being talking about is, is when, when the reviewers are talking about translations, how well are they doing it? And when reviewers are focusing on translations, when there are reviews about um, several different books and translations, are, are, are the reviewers behaving in the capacity of Translation police, which is a coinage that refers to people who happen to know the, the source language and um, will review an entire book and criticize the translation because there was one word they would have translated differently. And so the review becomes kind of a corrective, like the, re the substance of the review becomes, well, if I'd translated the book, I would have done it this way, which is not exactly as book critics, I think we would all agree, we never review, like if you're, reading a, if you're reviewing a book in English, you never say, if I'd written that book, I would have written it this way. <laughs> <laughs> Why would that conversation be a legitimate one for translation either? Um, so I think that we are arriving at a much more complex moment when we're thinking about what do we as translators, what, what is our ideal? What do we really want from reviewers? And what's, what's what, also a fair point, what is fair to, to expect in the book review world, um, in the commercial marketplace, in the case of a book where the translation might be excellent, but there's something else going on in the book that dominates the, sub the interest of the reviewer. So that's a really long preamble. I think what I'm trying to say is I think the conversation has gotten more nuanced and interesting at this point. That said, Let's go back to basics. <laughs> Let's go back to the basics. Um, one of the things Chad said that we, we that people do like to know is, you know, how do Mark is has no experience with translation, but frequently is asked to review books for translation. Mark, can you talk about where you review for a little bit mm -hmm. and how it is that you get asked to review books in translation? Sure, I've been doing this um, not full time, but pretty about half time for about the past five, six years now, and I've written for New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Barnes & Noble Review, some fairly substantive places that do long reviews, but the place where I most regularly review works in translation is for Kirkus Reviews. Is anybody here in the audience un completely unfamiliar with what Kirkus is? Kirkus is what's known as a pre-pub, so the, before the book is going to be reviewed by the New York Times or the major outlets closer to publication date, there are reviews of books that have come out about three to six months before that actually happens, and that is a way to inform booksellers about books that might be of interest or to help book people who run larger book reviews to make selections about what's of interest. Um, you're not allowed to tell anybody outside of this room that Mark reviews for Kirkus. No, you can say I review for Kirkus. I just cannot say which Wh oh, books wh I, oh, okay. which books I, I guess review. the the yeah. shield of so, so the, <laughs> so the reviews are anonymous, which makes some people in the, in the larger literary community a little bit uh, upset. I 
got assigned these to review works in translation mainly just because the fiction editor knows that oftentimes I can meet these books halfway. That oftentimes if there are books that are coming out from Dalkey or Open Letter that are a little bit outside of mainstream, a little bit more experimental, play with language a little bit more, I can tell my editor I'm game for that. I don't love all of it necessarily, but you know I'm willing to try to you know see what the author is doing, do a little bit of homework uh, to understand where it's coming from. The, the downside of this, to your point, Minna, is that the word count for Kirkus Reviews is 300 words. So I'm not going to have a whole lot of space to talk about issues with the translation. I don't have automatically a grasp of it. But the way that I've approached it is that my feeling is that every book teaches you how to read it. And each book has a certain integrity to it. And so if you see things, well, if it's a Swedish thriller where you know, you ex have a certain expectation for colloquial language that, you know, it's going to go down fairly easy and there's clunky prose, I'm willing to acknowledge that. And I usually don't say, well, it's the translator's fault. I'll say that, you know, either because of the translator or because of, you know, the source text, you know, something goes a little bit awry over here. So the best I can do is acknowledge it, but I don't try to lay blame squarely on one person or another in that. Does that answer the question? Yeah, uh, yeah. and. Um and stop us if there if you have a question we can we can make it a, an open discussion um katrine you do assign book reviews uh in your okay so you decide who's going to who's going to discuss what book and how sure talk to us a little bit about that process how do you if you see a book that you're like whoa we should really write about we should really put this on our blog or do people pitch you or how do those things come about um both um i i should start by saying um you know, I'm a blog editor at Asymptote, which means uh, I'm a part of the daily uh, uh, content on Asymptote, whereas we also have a criticism editor who um, is in charge of our quarterly uh, content. So our processes are very different, actually, I discovered in my research process for this panel. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, the quarterly mainly solicits reviews uh, almost exclusively. Um, and, and I discovered that Ellen, our criticism editor, actually um, sends out this really nice note where she writes what her expectations are in terms of reviewing a book in translation. Uh, so she has sort of guidelines for uh, how to review a book in translation, and I'd, I'd love to read it. Uh, it's really brief. Um, but later, uh, maybe. Well, you can read it now. I mean, I, um, I am Asymptote is specifically a book about, I mean, a, a, a a publication about work in yeah. translation, so there's a higher standard of attention. To yeah. It. Yeah. Um, sure. I mean, I can read it briefly now, so Don't that you guys we all know, know what. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Great. Um, yeah. So um, Ellen uh, sends this note out to all reviewers that she solicits, where she writes. Uh, we expect all reviewers to engage critically with the collaborative nature of translated texts. The translator, as well as the author, should be credited at the first mention of the book's title. Make sure you back up both praise and criticism of the translation with specific examples. If the translator has inc included a note describing his or her approach to the translation, it is useful to refer to this and indicate whether you think their aims have been achieved. Where previous translations of a work exist, we recommend you compare their approaches with specific reference to short passages so you can indicate the contributions made by the new one. If the original author is known for particular literary qualities, it will be helpful for you to assess whether they appear in the translation. We are happy to see intelligent criticism by writers unfamiliar with the language of the original as long as they address the fact responsibly in their review. That's, so, it sounds like a model. Yeah, yeah that's like the ideal, letter. right? So it's, it's also, a, a, you know, the fairy tale ideal that doesn't, you know, take into consideration time and uh, word length. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, mainly time. I would say um, that's the main thing because. First of all, I mean, many of these indie publications don't pay their reviewers, so that's one thing. So they can't expect you to read a review in both the original language and the translation and other translations, too. <laughs> so it is really a model, and we're not oblivious to the fact that it's kind of impossible. But still, like, it's nice to send out these guidelines just to like be clear about what, what the ideal would be, what we expect. Um, that being said, I, I edit the blog with uh, Patty Nash, who is here. Uh, she's wearing a hat. Patty? 
Where are you? Yeah, I've had it. She oh, she took off the hat. Okay, great. Um, okay, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so we, we co-edited the blog and, um, you know, we, uh, we try to discuss um, every month we have this um, uh, roundup called New in Translation or What's New in Translation. And so we try to discuss what, what titles, uh, you know, are relevant uh, to, or relevant, how do you say that, uh, titles that we've noticed. Uh, that have either been reviewed elsewhere or that we've discovered through our uh, own network on social media. You know, people uploading a photo of a book saying, this is incredible, I can't wait for it to come out in this and this uh, month. Uh, and so... Um, Based on the Kirkus review? Yeah, sure, frequently. also that, yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, so, so, uh, so we discuss uh, what we would like to be a part of our What's New in Translation roundup, but also uh, we invite reviewers to pitch to us as well, uh, mainly from our own large team of editors. Uh, they will, you know, we have country editors uh, who are situated all over the world, and they will pitch... Uh, a, a review to us, for instance, and be like, this is, is something that's really interesting that I'd like to review. It's coming out in October. Could we put it, slate it for the What's New in Translation October? Roundup. How long are those reviews, the blog reviews? Uh, so, um, well, so we publish, um, it depends on what, what's submitted to us. Uh, our What's New in Translation roundup is, basically it can be anywhere from like three paragraphs to like a whole like full-length full review uh, and sometimes we decide to publish those full-length reviews separately from the roundup uh, so it's it's very uh, it depends on what we get in basically mm -hmm. but I will say um, the uh, at the blog we do not send out this letter uh, beforehand because we mainly get content and then we just edit it when we receive it because it's a daily blog so that also means that sometimes Patty and I have to actually go in and tell the reviewers that they have to mention the translator. Mm -hmm. so, so Ellen, who's the criticism editor of the quarterly, she, I, I, she told me she never has to do that because she's already sent out the guidelines. But with us, we get the content and we have to edit it um, just from, from whatever the reviewer thought was reasonable in terms of translating this work. And so uh, I've had to like tell our own team members sometimes that they should um, focus a little more on the review, even though we're a translation journal, you know. Uh, we um, tend to, uh, I don't think we necessarily forget, but maybe we're under time pressure when submitting, and then sure. we'll just, uh, we'll just uh, try to focus on uh, explaining what the book is about, and then write, yeah, beautifully rendered by this and this person into right. English. So, yeah. Okay. Michelle, so you... You read a lot of the reviews. You don't assign them, correct? Correct. Yeah. So what is the, um, in, in preparing for this, you were looking at the reviews that you're publishing, and do you have a sense of how they, how, you, how generally translation is approached in your magazine, and could you explain it? Yeah, since I'm not the book review editor, this uh, took me on a really interesting um, uh, educational mission of looking at our review section from a different perspective. For the past 10 years, I've edited, copy edited every book review that went into our pages. And so, of course, I've closely read all of our reviews, but I haven't been the person who's been assigning the reviews. Our recently retired book review editor, Marla Johnson, has been doing that. And I'm sure some of you in here have probably reviewed for WLT and may have worked with Marla. But I met with her and visited with her and talked about how she's selected, which books to review, and um, over the years, and we've, of course, over the years talked about that. And I also looked back the past two years and thought about the different range of reviews, both in WLT's pages and in other publications, and started to see this spectrum of reviews. And I think it's really what you were talking about, Minna, where you have publications that aren't referring to the translator at all, or reviews that, as we've acknowledged, do say something about, do acknowledge that it's a translation, or maybe say the reviews that say, you just know, elegantly rendered or smoothly translated by. And then you have some reviews that go a little further and give a little more in-depth approach to the translation. And then you have some, and I was able to find a few good examples in our pages, 
of reviews that really get in depth in the translation to the point where the translator, I felt, really became the primary subject of the review. I would say those in, in any publication, though, are very rare. I think those are still very rare. Um, we publish reviews by people like Mark, who are not experts in the language, and we think those are very valuable reviews of translated works. And then we also have reviewers who are experts in languages. Our main mission is to bring translated literature from all parts of the world to the attention of uh, an English-speaking audience. So we're not going to wait until we establish a relationship with a reviewer in a language, finally find someone who will write a review for free about a language that we don't have a, a reviewer in to talk about a book and an author. We're going to go ahead and we're going to review the book. And we're really interested in high quality reviews. So we're balancing a number of objectives. Geographical coverage, language coverage, gender coverage. We're balancing all of these objectives. And Marla said, of course, she does value, has valued over the years, when you have someone who's also an expert in the language. But we also see the value in other reviewers and people who bring different perspectives to the reviews. And so we really are open to different types of reviewers and what they bring to the reviews. And if you, going back through our pages, I could see the differences. And, you know, just for fun, I also pulled, like, a, a variety of different reviews from different publications of Juan Pablo's Villobos' Quesadillas. You could find one from one publication that did mention that it was, that didn't even make any mention at all of the translation. Another from another publication that didn't mention the translator at all, but had a really nice perspective about the political uh, the political climate. It was very useful. It provided a lot of good background. I could see the value in that, even though it didn't focus on the translation at all. There was something valuable about that review from another perspective. Then ours, which was by an expert and also a translator, and he provided a very slight, sparse, he's a fairly new translator, a sparse, but he did touch upon the translation. Another that touched upon the translation barely, but was critical, and had a little bit of that translation police ex- um, approach to it, and I never did find one for that particular book, Quesadillas, in my very quick research, and maybe there is one out there, there probably is, that really did the full um, translation review that I think is so rare. I saw David Shook sneak in a minute ago, he's back there, he probably won't raise his hand now that I'm going to call him out. <laughs> Where is he? I know he's back there. Hi there he is. There. <laughs> he's hiding under a hay. as a hat, too. It's the hat. <laughs> he recently did a really nice review for us, and I think it's a good example of what someone who is, a, who is also a translator and a poet can bring, um, of a collection of an indigenous Mexican poet's collection of poetry. And he did a very finely nuanced review that brought uh, the translator's perspective into the review. And I think it's a very fine example of what an expert can bring to review. But I think that's very rare where we are now, but I think these are all the types of questions for people to be asking within this conversation. Yeah. Does that help as far as what we're Does doing? It help? Did I wander off? I do <laughs> no. that. So um, I, was, I was, was looking at some, our panelists sent me some different reviews and, um, and I was, um, and I started reflecting on, um, there's a review by Ben Lerner of My Struggle in the London Review of Books where he just talks about how mediocre it is. <laughs> the writing, the cliches, the, you know, he goes on and on, all of the things you can say about what a really dreadfully written book it is. And then sort of, and then does an about face and says, and yet it's amazing. It's an, inter it's an interesting, it was an interesting review to read right before coming here because it does not talk about the trans doesn't talk about the translator. The the conversation about the language, its mediocrity and its brilliance lives entirely with Nausgaard and Ben Lerner's relationship to that text. So I was trying I was trying to think about this paradox of when um, I was trying to find examples of where a book is 
criticized and the, its mediocrity or its failings are blamed on the translator by the reviewer. And when a book is hailed as great and it's all the responsibility of the writer, which I do think is sort of the, you know, the great writer versus the flawed translator kind of conundrum. And I, I was trying to find examples of it and thinking who I could throw under the bus. And then, <laughs> and then I remembered my translation of Federico Fellini's biography, which, um, which I did not like the book very much. I thought it was very poorly written. And it was very hard to translate because it was poorly written. And I d actually did an expose in Time Out New York about how much I hated translating it and how feeble I thought the original was. <laughs> Um, and I found two reviews of that book. One which said, it seems like a really slight book, and the translation, the choices the translator made seemed to set the reader up to take it with a grain of salt. So he actually gave me credit for distancing, I don't even know how he did this, for distancing myself in the translation from the work. And it was sort of like an acclaim. And then a little bit further down um, on the same, amp that was a Publishers Weekly review. And then there was a very angry customer review. <laughs> that said, this is really a terrible book. And the language is dreadful. And it's filled with these run-on sentences, you know, cliches, um, sentences that don't end. It's really a terrible translation. Um, There you go. Well, they, <laughs> but what that what, what I wanted to, what the reason I wanted to think about that paradox is that those are just two different ways of reading. Those are just two different readers and two different interpretations of what was going on with the text. The reason I'm prefacing that to asymptote just ran a discussion between um, Sue Burke and Maya Ev Evrona about what the ideal review from the point of view of a translator would be. And I'd be curious to know how much those of you who are translators would agree with, in particular, Sue Burke's ideal. She calls it a fairy tale. Um, but this is her declared, this is what would be an ideal review for translation. While any book review has to cover a lot of ground, at some point I think it ought to explicitly acknowledge that the work being reviewed is a translation and mention its apparent approach, since a translation in some ways rewrites the original. If possible, it might compare a passage of the original to the translation and note whether the translation wrestles successfully or not with linguistic and cultural challenges, captures its literary quality like elegance or immediacy or wit, and accurately conveys both the meaning and the subtext. Ideally, the review might even compare the translation to any earlier ones and weigh how this translation offers a new outlook on the original work. Whether it is the first or 20th translation, the review could also consider how much the work itself expands or not the literary resources for the target language. Much of, the literature is, much of literature is in fact a dialogue, and this is a new voice or a new rendering of that voice will speak to readers and writers who could not hear it before. Now, I read that by Sue Burke and thought, I'm not sure I would want to withstand that scrutiny, <laughs> personally. But I'm, I'm interested how that resonates with with those of you out, I mean, who of you are coming as a translator and who's coming, who's a translator interested in being reviewed well in this group? And, <laughs> and who would like to be, of those people, uh, would all of you like to be reviewed as Sue Burke describes? As what? In this way, is this your ideal of being reviewed? Do you share that? Not to put him, and then who's a reviewer? So how do you reviewers feel about that? I'm just curious. Does anybody have an impression? It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Coming from both sides, like, how are we supposed to sleep? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, I think my struggles is an interesting example of this because yeah. I actually did an interview with, with Nausgaard where he yeah. talked a little bit about the intentional slovenliness of his <laughs> prose. And I kind of came away from that with kind of a newfound admiration for uh, Don Barton, Don Barton right? yeah. his translation of it because it does 
what Ben Lerner talks about, that it is sort of, it's, it's sloppy, it's cliche-driven, it's mm -hmm. run-up, but it's so, it keeps pulling in, at least it keeps pulling me in. And that made me feel that he was keeping faith with Nausgaard's intentions. And I think, you know, if, if I had become aware of something where Nausgaard said, well, I really was looking for something very tight and very lyrical, and then you were reading this, then you would say, okay, well, something has clearly gone a little bit off here. It succeeds, but on in ways that are different from the author's intention, which is a flaw, I mean, even if it is successful. So um, it was interesting to at least know that the translator and the author were in line um, mm -hmm. on that front. Do any of the three of you have reviews where you know you should mention the translator, but you just say, I really, it's not, doesn't fit, it's not working, even in asymptote? Where, it's, uh, where it doesn't fit mentioning the translator? Yeah, or where you really feel like you're just tacking on something and you kind of oh. wish that you didn't have to? No, I feel like there's always something to say about a translation, right. to be honest. I mean, I'm sorry, but there is. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a translator myself, so I, I just, I know how much work a translator puts into a book. So obviously there's something to be said about that. So as we mentioned in our idealized version of what a, a translation, a, a review should be, um, you know, if there's a translator's note, if there's something where the translator has uh, provided some thoughts on the translation, then uh, that would be ideal to put into the review. I mean, I don't see how it doesn't fit a review, you know, and you can either, as, as a reviewer, you can either, you know, look at the introduction in the book, if there is one, or, you know, Google the translator's name, see if an interview comes up or anything, mm -hmm. you know, like that's, that's something that's a compromise where you don't have to do, do like a lot of work, but you can still incorporate the translator somehow. Yeah. There's a, um, a really good interview by Scott Esposito with Don Bartlett in the Paris Review Daily about trans the translation project. Um, and it's true, there's so much information that comes to us as readers. I guess it helps when books are six volumes long, because there's because th as a book review editor and a signer, you start getting lost for like, are we just going to review the next installment? You know, even with the Ferrante's fourth book, I had, it, it's very difficult. What are we going to do? We're just going to talk about it again. We're just going to find another person. And so that's when the translator does start to emerge because we're extra <laughs> material. <laughs> yes? So in answer to your question uh, about uh, what I want to review that way, uh, I think it a lot would depend on who I was writing a review for. So if I was writing a review for the translation which is a translation, very, very translation, translator-centered yeah. publication, I would feel absolutely no qualms, I would have no qualms at all about pulling out passages and doing analyses, fairly detailed analyses, because my readers are going to be used to that. And right. And they've been expecting it. But if I'm writing a review for um, a general audience, and I start to do that, I, I actually, I would not start to do that. Mm -hmm. I would not... I would not pull out passages and do line by line analyses and do comparisons with the original. And I think there are plenty of other ways that you can talk about the translation without doing that. And without, because of the general audience in particular is going to just throw up its hands at that point and say, well, that person knows the original, must be good, must know what he's talking about. Right. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I think it happens often that a reviewer sort of throws out their authority there like that and implies that they know the original, they can read the source text, therefore they know what's good. <laughs> <laughs> and why We're all faking that and part, why yeah. Is bad. yeah. And they focus on individual lyric, uh, li um, uh, lexical items like what you discussed before and say it's bad because it should be this word, not that word. And mm -hmm. this is not a good way to write it's, I mean, it's interesting, the tolerance of a general readership for intricate discussions of translation, which we all love, I think. I'm speaking for everybody, maybe not, maybe not you. Um, but but for, for you guys, when you talk about your mission is to bring this work to more readers. So how much do you want to create an app, a, a kind of more academic apparatus? Is academic fair? And my more academic apparatus around the discussion of the translation at the risk of alienating, of pushing a general reader away from a book, it's almost like saying, this movie really has subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> it 
Well, I, I think I think that we've. Um, go ahead. Oh, I, just very quickly. I mean, I just it doesn't have to necessarily be as dry as that. I was about going to say that you know if I was going to have in the same way we're talking about what our magical unicorn translation review is going to look like, I think about you know what would be. One thing that I wish I had more of in terms of either what is submitted from the publisher in terms of one sheets or information or in the translator's note is not so much about sort of like the linguistic choices and translation choices, but the cultural space that the book occupies. Why was this book published? Why does, you know, what, you can, oftentimes when I see uh, information about book, it's, it's been a bestseller, it won a prize, which is great to know, but, you know, what is the reputation of the author? What community does this author belong in? What sort of, how did this resonate with the community in which it was published when it was first published? Why is this book important? I don't have to necessarily believe that there, there could be different disagreements about that, but I want to hear a little bit more about what specific place this book occupies. Because one thing that happens, I think, with quote unquote lazier reviewers is that sometimes books in translation, the author is treated as sort of an ambassador for the entire country's literature. So, you know, Haruki Murakami is Japan, or, but you know, David Grossman is not, Edgar Carrot is not Gail Harabin. I mean, there's a, a robust kind of community of different types of writing in, in, within one country. And having that book positioned for a reviewer um, a little bit better would help avoid some of those sort of kind of more glib, broad brush statements about, you know, what the translation is. That, and you're talking to publishers about right. that. Right now, you're addressing the publishers. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, sorry. Give us better information. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm pushing the blame away from you. Yeah. <laughs> this is something that you need to fix. So. Michelle, you were. Oh, I think you're, you asked a question that went to how interested we are. Yeah. Well, I think our Translation Tuesday blog that we've been running for the past couple of years has taught us, or really not taught us, but really validated that. The people who are looking at world literature today, whether they be academics or more general readers, are really interested in what translators do. Uh, maybe not getting into a very academic discussion of translation, but they're very interested in the art of translation and the subject of translation. So we like, we've included, we're now including a translator's note, what we call the notebook section up front, trying to incorporate more and more and more of translator vi visibility and information that goes a little deeper into what translators do and how they do it. That said, we are really not trying to push what you would call an academic um, perspective throughout, because I think that we are, are trying to attract a broader readership, something that will satisfy people who are uh, more in the club and more academic, but also people who aren't. And if it's consistently academic throughout, it may feel a little overwhelming to people and shut a lot of people out. So I think that our review section that has some that do provide more in-depth discussion of the mechanics of the translation and some that, that, that perhaps aren't able to incorporate that in the review uh, provides both perspectives and something for different types of readers. And I think that the way that we're approaching that tolerates those differences and provides those uh, differences among our readers and reflects our kind of a broad readership. But we have uh, been validated by our tra Translation Tuesday blog and our belief that people are broadly interested in what translators were doing. They like to read about it and it was quickly our most popular blog series. Do you have to add to that, Katrine? Um, yeah, I mean in terms of uh, um Thinking of the reader, uh, we're also aiming for the intelligent lay reader uh, mm -hmm. at Asymptote, and we want to, um, you know, be free of, uh, largely free of scholarly apparatus yeah. such as yeah. I don't want to sort of um, retract a little bit on the academic, but yeah. I do mean maybe to specialize, maybe it's just specialized. Um, I said I said academic, but I might have yeah. like putting too much. Yeah, on that. I mean we so we don't our our reviews don't focus that much on the translator but it's more aware of the translators that I think mm -hmm. than I think a lot of other reviews are so mm -hmm. still our reviews in asymptote are just normal your normal reviews uh, accessible to uh, you know literary readers um, but then we will have maybe a large paragraph uh, that uh, talks about the translation uh, so so again um, you know, the ideal would be all these like comparisons and whatnot, but the reality is 
uh, you know, we, we only have so much space for a review, and so we just offer these guidelines, and then the, the reviewer will take whatever they take from it, and then, you know, do their own thing with it. Should we talk about, um, does anyone have a question on this? Does anyone want to add anything now? Okay, just interrupt me if you want to. What about reviewers who don't really know the source language as one, you, you know, what do you find is the difference and do you ever think that it's better if the reviewer doesn't? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, again, I have a really good quote from our criticism editor she's because awesome. I just <laughs> love her. It's, her name is Ellen Jones and she's a PhD in comparative literature um, in somewhere in London and she's just, she's amazing. So uh, because I asked her, um, um, Sorry, I asked her, what do you mean when you write, we're happy to see intelligent criticism by writers unfamiliar with the language of the original, as long as they address the fact responsibly in their review. And I was like, what do you mean by that? You know, what is that? And then she said, well, I quite like criticism that is slightly personalized, so I'm always happy for reviewers to explain the limitations of their language competence. Um, being responsible about it might involve citing other sources if they're reflecting on a word phrase tendency in the original, such as dictionaries or other translations. But it also might involve just admitting when they're not qualified or experienced enough to remark on the quality of the translation as a translation, but rather on its quality as a new and independent piece of writing, its value as an English language work. So, you know, that's, that's something where you, as a reviewer, can step in and say, I'm reviewing this as a piece of English language work, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I, I don't know Chinese, yeah. you know. I don't know Chinese, um, uh, but as, as a book in English, this is what I think of it. This is what I think of the sentences, you know. And then you can argue, you know, it might be due to the translator, I don't know, but this is what I think of it as an English language work. I find as a reviewer sometimes it's bad if I know too much about the, like say there's some big writer that I wanted to translate but I didn't get the job. And <laughs> <laughs> And then I'm reviewing it, and I have, you know, I would have done it differently. What happens when you get into that territory, at least editorially? Is that a good, I mean, that can't be a good thing. And how does the readership know the difference between an, a grudge or backseat reviewing, mm -hmm. and, or backseat translating, mm -hmm. and a fair review? Yeah. Times book review does so many ethically questionable assignments. <laughs> I almost would want to put them on a different plate. Yeah, I do. I do think it's. A, yeah, yeah. But I do think. Yeah. So. Right, but if you were a review editor and someone said, oh, and you were looking for someone to review the book, might not you say, oh, well, Minna knows all about this author. She translated this early piece. Wouldn't she be good? Mm -hmm. right. And as a reader, would you be interested in knowing yes. then what I thought? Mm -hmm. well, is, is that, I mean, there's... I don't know either. I just think it's I, fun to ask well, these questions. I, 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 I think it is more of an ethical thing, especially yeah. if you feel like you have some engagement with that author or that community, mm -hmm. and especially like if you were in the running for it. Yeah. I mean, it gives you an expertise, but it's an expertise you kind of need to cop to and explain your experience. That can make a review rich. I'm, I've pulled back on being scorched earth about that sort of, you know, those sort of things. So long as you're disclosing, yeah. um, you know, that helps me understand where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. So I can take your dismissal. You know, yeah. 
I'll, I'll also say, as an editor, it's you know I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't question the the criticism in the review. You know, like I have to go in and look logically at the arguments presented, and you know, it, during my editorial process, I'll ask questions for the reviewer and be like, "What do you mean when you say this? Do you have an example? You know, right. like stuff like that, really basic really stuff basic for an editor. editor yeah. You know, mm -hmm. but um, you know, so that's also on the editor. If someone gets published where it's just you know, a terrible rant about how awful this translator is. It's up to the editor to stop that and to nuance it uh, by working with the reviewer. Yeah. Yes, Russell. No, that, about treating, treating, since you entered the realm of treating the work as an English language work, you're making So are you I'm arguing for... I'm saying it's, it's a more radical stance than we're usually willing to say it is. We say, oh, it sounds like it's an English language word, but what we're really saying is we don't care what the source says. Anymore. If it's working, for most reviewers, I would think, especially in the mainstream environment, you're not acknowledging the translator, but you're judging the book based on its English performance exclusively. And that's, and as a reviewer, I always come to that. I'm just reading the book as it's given, I, I have what I have in front of me and that's what I'm going to respond to. Um, and so you're saying that's sort of this radical normal behavior? Right. Once you start down that road, you have to say, we're not even going to talk about the source anymore. All we know is a little biography about the author. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to talk about this English language word. So if we had a room full of sources, if all of those source people were in here, they would rise up with pitchforks yeah, against yeah, us. Yeah, and they'd be I, right. The radical stance is probably fine for us translators. It's probably fine for a review in a translation mag like TR. Right. But then there's the mag that has lots of general readers in which translations are for only 10% of the total body. And it's not so fine for that. And there, it's a thing to, it's never occurred to most of those general readers. So it would not be fine. Yes, in the back. So how often do you see negative reviews of translations and criticizing translations? Is it something that comes up more and more? Well, that's interesting. The more that we ask for it as editors, the more we're going to get it, right? The more opening there is for a negative yeah. review. Mm -hmm. but, but did they really go on the long in a review of, let's say, a, a work, you know, or did they build, or this is the kind of thing you might want critical articles for specialized, specialized readership. I mean, it's really a, I mean, a lot of it, there's a lot of quibbling. The times I've seen really negative reviews, they're usually weak translations. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff gets smarmy and, and, and it's really not, you know, why read it, you know? I mean, somebody may say it's a boring translation, I don't like it, so the others were just as good, but, you know, what's the point of translating, or what's the point of reviewing or publishing a review? <laughs> I'm kind of with you on that last <laughs> I, I, What I think is interesting that's occurring to me over the course of this discussion is I'm thinking how popular, um, you know, those grammar like the grammar columns are and the call-in shows, how much people like to say, well, irregardless is an, you know, they like to call in and ask the expert and vent their ideas about how people use irregardless and things like that. Like, those are very popular um, 
editions of Le the Leonard Lopate show. There's a section in the New York Times Magazine with your grammar questions. Is it possible that we can be appealing as translators and writers about translation to that kind of geekier element and 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 turning like sort of working to demonstrate the delight in the translation process and incorporating that into the review rather than this idea of evaluating and comparing and contextualizing so much as as talking about you know this 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 process of transference and isn't the, sort of appealing to the crossword puzzle aspect of translation and letting a general readership share in that. Yes, uh, but I mean it requires the same amount of talent, I think, and skill that you would require to write a very thoughtful review of, say, a Jonathan Franzen novel and understand the nuances there. I mean, I think you know, I, I, and I, I enjoy those pieces when I read them. I think I think I sent you a piece that Masha Gessen had written about various translations of Anna Karenina, or there was a takedown of a translation of Ovid that I had read recently that you know gave me an excuse to stop reading this boring translation of it halfway through because it was explaining you know why the translation uh, bulked it up and hurt it. And I learned a little bit about Latin translation. I'm always going to be a dilettante on that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a matter of being in the hands of a very sophisticated and intelligent critic, and I don't know if that's um, you know, in and of itself, it's not interesting, but a good writer can make it interesting. Um, yeah, I would also like to just bring up my example that I sent to mm -hmm. you, uh, which is uh, Amo Hussain's uh, review of Silvina Ca Ocampo's uh, yes. Thus Were Their Faces, mm -hmm. uh, published in the October issue of Asymptote. Uh, get a postcard here if you want to check it it's out. It's a terrific, it's an amazing piece. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this. Um, this translation was, um, or this um, book was translated by Daniel Balderson for New, New York Review of Books Classics. Um, and so Amal Hussain, in his uh, review, uh, addresses uh, the translation this way, by one paragraph, but I think it's, it's just very elegantly done. Um, Amal Hussain writes, does Ocampo's style transcend linguistic barriers? In Spanish, her prose is uncharacteristically stripped down. In English, essentially a less ornate language, Ocampo's precision isn't as remarkable, though her deft use of bizarre and poetic imagery is ably captured by Balderston, who also provides an afterword in which he mentions her wild, odd syntax. What he conveys even more effectively than the ir irregularities of her grammar is the ferocity of her narrative method. His selection, um, his selection often displays Ocampo's paradoxical ability to rework similar material from different angles and yet be versatile and, as Borges noted, wide ranging. Yeah. So that's just a really elegant way of saying something does get lost in translation. However, I really enjoy this translation in English. I really enjoy this poetry in English. Oh, what I admire is that it really talks about English. Yeah, it, exactly. And it talks about the original's relationship yes. to the English language. Yes, while informing yeah. the reader of how the original language uh, poetry is. Yeah. yeah. Questions? I'm yeah. Uh, how much decision uh, involves the literary world? based on the quality of the translation. Because sometimes when I send out submissions, uh, I got a reply, this is not suitable for this magazine. And then I resubmit it to some other magazine, and they say, thank you for sending us such a good story. So I'm wondering with the, I'm wondering with the American literary magazines, how much decision is based? Are you? Do you mean in terms of submitting original original translations to be published, or crit, or or review, or criticisms? Uh, submitting an original translation to be submitted. So I have a panel tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> about uh, about about from publishers' point of view about about editing translations and and. Um, and responding to them, and um, that might be something we can answer better there. If you don't mind me putting it off till then, I don't want to use all my material. 
<laughs> there was another question. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, I was thinking um, about uh, the uh, analogy between ac academic reviews as opposed to non-academic reviews and how it, it came up several times and no one's satisfied with it. And it, it made me think of a, another possible analogy, um, which I think might actually get at it more. Uh, and also explain some of the reason why the so-called non-academic reviews are are pushed, particularly by publishers. Um, why couldn't we compare it to to uh, theater in um, sort of pre uh, pre Pirandello theater, where there's a fourth wall, and that would be the non-academic. We're delivering this thing, you know, as if it's actually there. Um, and it's, it's in the world, as opposed to, you know, a review that, that shows the scaffolding and, and lets you see, you know, a kind of wrecking theater. Um, and, uh, and that would be the one that, in some sense, um, focuses on, on the translation or, or the, the other cultural um, components of, of, uh, of how an author is situated in their culture. So the difference between an academic review and a non-academic review, but the kind of non-academic yeah, review that we want is style. Between fourth, fourth wall proceeding theater and, and recting in theater. Because the, the reason I would push it that way is, is that I think we've, we've all been to both and, and, and know how to appreciate them. Right? It's so interesting. It's, so it's not so much. Yeah. That, and, and both could appeal to mass audience. I think and so. The Book of the Month Club study that Jan Radway did years ago, one of the cases she, she looked at, she said, you know, how is it possible that, that, that the incredible whiteness of being was picked up by the Book of the Month Club? And, and the reason they did, she said, is because they just said, well, there's such a great voice here. So, so they just delivered it as if, you know, there it was. And it's like the, the assumption that it's an English word. And Tim Park said that in the talk that's not a gift that they did not stop all the way. said, well, of course the, the translator's not going to be out of the why, why would a publisher want to remind people they're not reading it? <laughs> the, and, and that's the thorny place you just took us. <coughs> that's it. And, there. And I was thinking about Tim Park. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, about please. Yeah. I've always wondered why there are more, uh, since so many authors come into English whose uh, other works we don't know, you know, they come in their first book, we don't know anything about them, yet it might be translated by a translator who has 10 other books in English. I'm wondering why there aren't any reviews of that sort of say, well, this translation by this translator is different from the previous translation by this translator, or is, it is distinguished by these vocal differences by this translator's other work in English. Um, they're, they're never done that way. Maybe for the same reason that she mentions that they don't put translators' pictures on the cover, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> they should. Yeah. You, you could do that. I just never seen it. I wrote, you wrote, I wrote down that proposal. Writing, I'm going to write it down. Yeah, no, it's, it's called Russell's idea. proposal, <laughs> and I wrote it down because I think it's such a cool idea. And it is interesting. It's actually more interesting than the Masha Gessen piece, which is a little bit of backseat translating, and, we, and, and I disagree with your... I, I mean, I can see why it's fun. That's the thing. I can see why you would come at that... Like, oh, here are these different translations, and these are the different choices they made, and that's fun. It's fun to kind of play with it. But it would be equally as fun to look at, you know, the seven different, totally different, you know, books that, you know, Michael Henry Heim translated and, you know, what, what choices he made in the different books to represent different authors. What's the versatility? Mm -hmm. You know, how is, how is Michael Henry Heim the Philip Seymour Hoffman of <laughs> <laughs> the greatest method actor of the generation? You know, but I mean, but... Yes, that is. It's a really interesting. I think it's a great and interesting idea, and I think we should all do it. <laughs> yes. I'm a great fan of Audible. Uh huh. And it's well known that people who listen to Audible 
books a lot will start following the particular uh, reader. So instead of my wanting to go through all the Gunter Grass, I'm going through the particular reader for the tin drum who I really like who's also been reading other things. Um, so, but that's a, a lot easier for a sort of an ordinary human to understand the difference. That some people's voices and rhythms are wonderful. I think trying to do that in a written text is really uh, technically a lot harder than most folks aren't going to learn it. My sense of book reviewers, whether translations or not, is we're sort of in a family of sports writers. We basically like what we're doing. We like reading, and we want to share that with other people. And we're not investigative reporters on the whole. We're not looking for the worst thing that can be, uh, and explain why nobody should ever read this book. <laughs> if I can give in a book to, to review that I don't like, I'll tell the editor. I can't review this. I think it stinks. I'm, I'm with you. There, it's true. There are. I, I am that kind of reviewer too. I think it's much harder to figure out what's amazing about a book and much more compelling to do in your mind. But there are reviewers who love. To, they just get a kick out of panning, and that's their, that's their fun. But, um, but so I'm so, looking at me. I'm not that person. <laughs> but, you know, but you did say, oh, but yeah, I know about those reviewers well, who just yeah. think there's the art of the pan. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, the weird thing with Kirkus is that they kind of have an unspoken sort of no takesy backsies rule. So, like, you know, if you, you you don't get a whole lot of choice in what books are going to send you, but once you've got it, you're engaged with it. If you, and, and Kirkus uh, has a reputation for being harsh sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've written some of those reviews, but um, you know, it's not because I have this particular joy to really just destroy something. I mean, again, I, I get these books because I'm willing to meet them halfway and try yeah. to understand where they're coming coming from culturally. I understand the reviewers who want to say, well, no, I don't want to do this, but. I mean, the pure, the pure craft of reviewing is one of love, loving reading and thinking about the book. And I mean, that's why a person comes to reviewing. And if you happen to be a reviewer interested in translation, that might be some of the pleasure that you're taking in exploring a book. If you're just looking at it from a reviewer's perspective, I'd actually, I, 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 I think, Margaret, we talked a lot in the Penn Translation Committee about ideal reviews, too. We have Sue Burke's idea. Um, you know, and it occurs to me that really, like, I think in a way almost the best reviewer for translation is a, someone who's, trans, who's translated, but maybe not that work, that century, that language. It's just someone who's had contact mm -hmm. with the act of translation. And that's kind of what we as, re, as translators would want is we want a reviewer who's translated once, mm -hmm. you know, uh, hopefully successfully, right? Yeah, I mean, I would also just like to encourage some kind of activism in this area. I mean, we're sitting a whole room filled with translators. You should all be reviewing translations, basically. I mean, just to sort of encourage this way of reviewing, you know, because you're, we're all able to, you know, we can all make a difference. Uh, is, is, are all the hands going up saying, okay, Katrin, can you tell us how we get to be reviewers? <laughs> <laughs> that is the next obvious question. I mean, so how do you get to be a reviewer? Yeah. Like, I agree, that's great. Yes. Now what do, what, yes. are they, what do you Good. do? Um, send me an email. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but seriously, I mean, I know a lot of editors who are just looking for reviewers all the time. So if you, just, if you are specialized in a certain language, just email the uh, criticism editors or the reviewers editors uh, all around and, and you know, just let them know you exist and they might start sending you books or if you have a, an idea already for a book, then pitch it. You know, it's, it's really that simple. And then once they have your review, they can start editing it or if it's a really shitty review, they'll tell you, I'm sorry, we can't publish this. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, it's not, it's not hard to write a review. I mean, you just... You, you, you look for reviews that you think are well written and then you try to use that example, you know? I, I, w I will say that in terms, it's, it's in terms of getting, getting to a book review editor and pitching yourself as a reviewer, if you have something you know that other people don't, 
like a lot about you know ancient Chinese literature, that gives you an in because mm-hmm. that book review editor has no, has no idea mm-hmm. what to do with this new ancient Chinese literature book <laughs> they just got. And then you magically write them, and, and everything sort of the stars align. Yeah. So it's good to have specialized knowledge, and it, even just say I translate. So I'm I'm interested in writing about translated books. Uh, book review editors are looking for mm-hmm. for you. And I think also on top of that, people who can kind of defog the culture that the book is coming from. But somebody who can say, here's this book that's coming out of this country, here's why it matters. Mm-hmm. Um, that's yes. something that is always going to make it, uh, book review editors yeah. isolate them. Because they get these books and they're not sure what to do with them, they're not sure why they're important. Yeah. But if they can have a smart reviewer who can explain, this is important and here's why, yes. mm-hmm. that helps. That's true. Also, the detail-oriented uh, editor will maintain a spreadsheet of um, you know, reviewers <laughs> from the different countries which means, you know, they'll always have you on record in case they get something in. Mm-hmm. Just saying. Yes? Uh, a little bit of a snarky question in response to that. The encouraging, like, <laughs> definitely also to encourage translated to review as well, but doesn't that make an already very small and kind of exclusive community a little bit smaller and a little bit more exclusive rather than opening it up to more and more readers and different readership? No. <laughs> no, it, Thank it, you, it, it, it doesn't because because when you're looking at a when you are a, a very busy book review editor and you have piles and piles and piles of books, it's like you're looking for reasons to not review a book, mm-hmm. and if the reason is I don't know who's gonna I don't I don't know someone who can who knows anything about you know Japanese boom they're just they're, there's there's so much going on there's so many books coming out that it's, there's a process of elimination that's going on. And so the more that we can infiltrate the world and make it harder for the books to get tossed into the send to Powell's pile, then, then the more the world gets opened up to the general readership. This is especially true with magazines. I'm thinking specifically of Book Forum. Um, the, that have both translated and non-translated? Yeah, they, they want to cover translated books, but they don't actually have a lot of people writing to them. And like, you know, a lot of people want to review the new Jonathan Franzen, but they don't have a lot of people writing to them and saying, you know, I can talk about I can talk about like new Arabic literature. You know, do you have something for me? I'm really good at it. And they'll say yes because I've been looking for you my whole life. Right. Yeah. 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 And I don't think yeah. I'm being fantastical no. in that. No, no, we're always looking for people for new people who can write quality reviews. Um, so if you're if you want to talk about it afterward, let's do that. It's an opening up. It is not a closing down. <laughs> yeah. More, more the question of, of kind of literature and translation is often viewed as this very niche genre. I, I can say this is a not translator and a person from the outside looking in. And if the people who are reviewing are also all from the inside, I can see how, as an external reader, that would be like, oh, okay, that's mm-hmm. they're, they're in their own field, and maybe that's not for me, and maybe that's not as accessible for someone qualified, like that's kind of where I think also the question of the overly qualified reviewer sure. versus yeah. accessibility. But that, that's, that's a writing talent sort of thing. You know, I want, if I'm reading a autobiography by a, a conductor or a composer, you know, having somebody who is a musician or a conductor, him or herself, that's a, that's a review I'm interested in reading if it's not necessarily a quote-unquote professional reviewer. I think, you know, there's that balance between you don't want to be, you know, the translation police, but, you know, some of you can bring the news. I always find that review very interesting. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about, and Russell mentioned earlier a really good point about sometimes people who are language experts let that get in the way and they end up becoming the translation police. And before they know it, they've written this kind of gotcha review where this need to focus on the five words that they would have done differently sort of overtakes the review. And I think that's when expertise gets in the way and it stops serving the reader. So I, I'm not opposed to us having reviewers who are experts in the, in the field in which they're reviewing, but it has more to do with that person's ability to keep the reader's needs foremost in, in, in their minds when they're, when they're writing the review, and it has to do with how you write the review and whether you let your expertise get in the way, whether you let yourself get in the way. And that might be because you have an axe to grind, or it might just be because you're letting what you're comfortable writing about what you the, the things that you like to write about get in the way, but it really that that to me is the key issue. It's okay to be an expert in the area for us, but you shouldn't let that get in the way and overtake. So that's an editorial. Oh. 
So this is a genuinely ignorant question, uh, but do reviewers get paid for their reviews? Not by, de not by World Literature Today. Yeah. And not by Athens. Uh, I get paid, so I don't know what that tells this, <laughs> this may be where you all walk out. I, there, uh, the, uh, some of the ma uh, book forum pays. I'm really, really pleased that now TLR pays for its online reviews a whole $25. But we pay something, which we're really proud of. Um, you know, people, it's, it's, we're all like, hey, translators who don't make any money, why don't you review too? <laughs> It's not. It's not going to pay the bills. It's. It's part of the, the the poetry part of what we're doing. If I may make a quick pitch, I'm on the. Board. He can pay the bills. No, I, <laughs> I can pay maybe my gas bill. Um, I, 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 just a quick pitch. I'm on the board of the National Book Critics Circle, which bookcritics.org, and one thing they do for its members is maintain a, maintain a list of book review outlets, and with a special a special focus on ones that actually do pay people. So. Yeah, and that's open. That you can get onto that list. Without becoming a member? No, you do have to be a member. And, and how much is the membership? Um, More than you get paid. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. About, you 50, can, about 50 bucks a year, but it's worth it's, it. It's, it's totally not that much. No, you you do two reviews for TLR, you pay for the National Book Critics Circle, you have your clips that let you in, and it's a well, done deal, and you're. The National Book, Book Critics Circle? Circle. Yeah, bookcritics.org. Yeah, that's an extensive. That is a good database. Yeah, and, and we it's a have good reference. Thank you for so. thank you for mentioning that. That's important. Yeah, there are a couple of ways that you can do some legwork online and find out you know, pretty easily. There are a bunch of literary magazines that do reviews. Colorado Review, I think, to, pays a little bit too. Yeah. You go to Poets and Writers and just do the filter, looking for publications that do book reviews, and then write directly to the editors that you pay for your book reviews, mm -hmm. and you'll know. Yeah. Uh, you might even go to their submissions page. And some of them will say, "Yeah, we pay." The literary magazines are a good place to begin mm -hmm. le begin flexing the muscles if it's not something you've done. It's a good it's a good place, and you're not going to get edited if you go if you go right away into um, uh, you mentioned uh, USA Today. Having written for USA Today, they'll just take your whole language and put it in a meat grinder and spit it out in tiny little like chewed up potato flex and. <laughs> You won't even recognize it anymore. <laughs> but those, the bigger places are going to edit the, the bejesus out of you. It's not going to, and it's not going to be as much of a learning experience. But you know, one other thing I would just recommend: if you're if you're hot to do this, I mean, you don't necessarily have to wait for some editor to tell you. I mean, start a blog, especially if there's a niche that you know that nobody else is really covering. You know, do a blog to just kind of like test the water, see how you feel about actually doing this sort of. Put it on a blog, put it on a Tumblr. And then if you're reaching out, you tell me if I'm wrong about this. But when you reach out to an editor saying, I'm really interested in Swedish literature, for the past six months, I've been maintaining a blog about new books in Swedish literature. Can I write for you? Yeah. I think that's a useful calling card. So you don't have to wait for an editor for permission to care about this stuff. You can care about it right now. Sure. Or you can just write to the Asymptote blog and get published immediately. <laughs> <laughs> the hurdle is great. <laughs> I mean, that's that. I, I feel like that's also something that these uh, free journals can do. I mean, I also just have to say, we don't get paid either. The editors don't get paid either. So it's all, you know, an ideological endeavor. Um, but uh, you know, that's a great way to like start getting published. You know, so that when you write to these other journals that do pay, you can link to, you know, the Asymptote blog, for instance, and be like, I published this review with Asymptote, and they'll be like, great, that's a great journal. So to get started, everybody should go to Asymptote. Basically, <laughs> or I mean, TLR. Yeah, not to steal, uh, not or, to, yeah. yeah, and not yeah. to steal your thunder. Yeah, or World Literature Today. Yeah. yeah. Margaret. I just want to remind you that one of our ideas was to start the best review of translation in the world. Yes. That's a great yeah. idea. That is a good idea. That's awesome. Right, let's do Wait. it. Yeah. Who's got money? <laughs> we're back to the beginning. Where are the standards? <laughs> oh, we're back to the beginning. What are the standards? We use those. Yeah, let's use uh, Ellen's email to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we'd all like to see Ellen. Like yeah, I'll, letter. yeah, I'll ask her. I'm sure that's fine with her. Yeah. Yes. So if one of us was to you know, decide to try and like write a review, and um, would you recommend having not done it before? Would it be good to kind of find another one as a template to kind of look at, or should we just kind of create one? You know what I mean? Gosh. Um, 
That's hard for me to answer because I don't know if your crazy looks like my crazy. I think looking at a review that you like, I would, but what I would do if I was trying to start writing reviews and what I did do was, was read reviews, find ones that I liked and, um, and kind of do a little bit of an imitation just structurally. That's what I would do. In my first reviews, I would do something structural and, um, and, and just the most important thing is, is to remember textual substantiation, which is sort of an undergraduate thing to say, but just remember to keep referring to your book because a lot of times when you're writing about, you can go into your head and you have to keep the focus on the book. So I would just say that. I'd, but I would find some reviews. We have a couple excellent ones that we pulled amongst ourselves for this panel. You can look at, you can look at reviews that you really enjoy reading. I read a lot of Angela Carter's book reviews from like the 70s. They were amazing. And then you just imitate the structure. And that's how I would start. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I can't go to a panel anymore. I'm wondering if <laughs> uh, you could elaborate a little bit more on the process of selection. For example, Mark uh, mentioned uh, cultural space that book occupies or the newness Hold on, I'm not sure like, I understood. Like, how, how do reviewers or editors select which books to... Oh, use? yeah, no, that's okay for today. The question of was, was, how do we choose translations to publish? Um, it has a lot to do with the, pre, the pre-publication, the, the industry journals, Publishers Weekly and Kirkus Reviews. It has to do with the material that the publishing houses send out. The, the pieces of paper that come folded in, in a review copy. It has to do with um, a publishing house's reputation. Um, it has to do with, um, is Chris still here? He just, he just left. So Chris was just here and last year they, you know, they published the Louisa. Um, yeah. Well, those syllables again. But you know, they published this book. It was really marvelous. Now, when his when his catalog is going to come in from Coffee House Press, a book review editor is going to say, "I wonder what he's choosing this year for his translation book because that last one was really good." So there's a little bit of what are people doing. Um, that's how that's how books get get chosen. It, it, I think. And, and then there, there is a certain, there's a certain amount of standing in front of a pile of books and, and opening it and reading a couple of lines and trying to get a sense of what it's like and if it seems interesting. Um, those are the different, do you agree those are the different criteria? That- yeah, and I would also say just outreach, like mm-hmm. from also the translator yeah. sometimes. I mean, uh, just uh, if, if you have a publishing house that's for some reason not engaging in this and not, is not, you feel like nothing is happening and they're not reaching out to editors for whatever reason, you know, you can send an email to a reviews editor and present yourself and, um, a really good idea is to uh, translate blurbs from the the original language, um, uh, you know, uh, the country of uh, the original uh, book, and translate blurbs from newspapers, like good review blurbs, uh, and then send that along because that will make an editor interested. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? We are running down. Everyone wants to go get their donuts. Their donuts? Donuts. Are there donuts now, Chad? <laughs> There's do- what? Five o'clock yeah, donuts? donuts? <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Wow. Do- yeah, that's just a cultural expression. Well, I a you know, go get your donuts. <laughs> Thank right. you.